Ah, ja. Hi, Wins. <lacht> And we can wait a few minutes until yeah. people have joined. I like the look and feel that you give, Olivia. <laughs> Why? I mean, this little tree, it's very cool. <laughs> I'm in the Christmas mood already. <laughs> yeah, I see that, I see that. <laughs> People start joining. <laughs> okay. I want to put that. I do it again. <laughs> Did you start recording? Yes, right? Uh, when I hit broadcast, it starts recording. So I think that Pablo will have to cut a little <laughs> the five first minutes. <laughs> it's fine. <laughs> but I click on recording on the cloud, you see? <laughs> we are doing it well. But last time I didn't even have the option. To hit yeah, recording. exactly. You, you have to go back to recording and mm -hmm. hit again uh, the, the key. Okay. Yeah. I mean, it's time so I can start. <clears throat> so, hello everyone. Uh, welcome to our uh, last Data Plus Women of the Year. Um, I'm very excited to have like a wonderful ladies today. I, I will let Olivia present uh, them to you. Uh, <clears throat> I just wanted like to uh, give some word about Data Plus Women. So Data Plus Women is a networking group in order to promote women working with or around data. And um, that's why we are like doing this event in order to bring awareness on that. Please, if you want to speak next time, contact us um, and don't be ashamed. <laughs> Um, I just wanted to say that on, the, uh, on this year, we have us like six events and uh, 17 speakers. So I'm very uh, proud of uh, what we have achieved with Olivia. So uh, I'm doing this Data Plus Woman with Olivia. Uh, Olivia, uh, it's still a data scientist at Credit Suisse. And uh, <laughs> she's currently on holiday, as you can see, it's sunny where she is. And I'm working as a visual analytic at Font Tobel. Um, let's, yeah, do you want to continue with the agenda, Olivia? Yeah, sure. Thank you, Annabelle, for introducing um, me and Data Plus Women and also a warm welcome from my side. Um, so, yeah, I'm also excited um, to have this last event before um, we, we hit the Christmas break and the next year. And this time we have three amazing speakers. Um, and we will start with Agat, um, who will present us something about um, her working as a commodities analyst in the chocolate company. So we're looking forward to that as well. Um, also as chocolate is now a very good topic for the Christmas season. <laughs> and then we have Jennifer and Dinushki who will um, also present us something around Christmas. In fact, they, will, um, they did an um, analysis on different Christmas recipes. Um, at the end, we will also have a chance to network. Um, so everyone who is interested in networking, please stay on this call and um, we will open it up for everyone to be able to speak. Um, so we hope to see some people um, there as well. So before we go into um, the presentations, let me quickly introduce you to our speaker. And I guess they will also have a chance later on to um, speak in more detail about themselves. But as I mentioned, we start with Agat. Agat is a, a global commodities market analyst manager at Bari Kalebo. And if you don't know it, um, it's actually a very famous, I think one of the largest uh, chocolate 
um, manufacturer in the world. Um, so very excited to speak about it or to hear about it. And um, Agathe has been using Tableau um, for a long time. Yeah, and we're just excited to hear what she has to say. And then we have Jennifer. Um, Jennifer works together with Dinushki as an um, analyst at Unifund. Um, they're both extensively using Tableau as well. And we already got a sneak peek of what they have um, <laughs> um, prepared um, for the presentation. Um, so excited um, to hear about that as well. And they're both founded um, or are co-founders of Her Data. Um, so also interesting to hear more about that. Um, Dinushki is a business analyst, as I already mentioned, together with Jennifer at Unifund. And um, she has a lot of experience with Tableau. And again, and they both uh, founded Her Data. So um, yeah, excited to hear what comes next. And I guess, um, Agat, um, it's your turn and the stage is yours. Good, thank you very much. So now I try to share. Uh, do you want to continue this? So I think you see my screen, right? It's good, okay. So thank you very much for welcoming me to the club. It's really the first time I participate. So I was really wondering what I could share. Given the theme of Christmas um, and uh, the fact I work in a chocolate company, I just thought it would be interesting to explain to you what my job consists in and, uh, and how does it really feel when uh, working for a chocolate company now since quite a while. Um, let me see, just did the next. Okay, so in short, so you have seen also, I've not put my, my picture before because I think it's more and more a trend and we have to follow up trends that, uh, that uh, uh, what counts is the message, it's not really the person who delivers it. Same way also, um, this is my CV and it is quite short, it's just three lines basically. I graduated uh, in agriculture and food industry, uh, then I worked for three years as an economic analyst for farmers. And then afterwards, 13 years in the commodities, uh, as a commodities analyst for the chocolate manufacturer. And for quite a while, I was really thinking, does it really make sense to have only these three lines? Does I have really a career? What did I learn? And actually through that presentation, I'm gonna show you that uh, actually I realized that I learned quite a lot and you don't need to have a lot actually to have a lot to say. You will get used to this small helicopter, I always talk about it with my team, because the job of analyst is actually to take the helicopter, look at the data and get the meaning out of it. And uh, here is uh, each time you will see actually how I have driven my helicopter and what I took out uh, with it. Here is three steps, but already so many learnings. First of all, what is a commodities analyst? It's a bit like a fortune teller, it's really easy. You just need to guess how the price are gonna move. Now, at the same time, there is something um, that I realized through my career is that actually I'm just, oh, I'm not even really trying to guess it. Actually, often what I say to people is, listen, my job is just to try to not be too wrong. And uh, the other way around is also to say, you know, if I, because they always look at me also, but how do you guess the market? Do you succeed? I just say, okay, listen, I don't have a Ferrari in the garage. So not all the time. At the same time, I'm still 13 years in the company. So I guess I'm doing it relatively well. But at the end of the day, it's very fun to try to guess those prices. And that's really what I'm going to share with you. Why commodities in chocolate? Chocolate is just cocoa, no? Now, sorry for the Christmas moment, but we are fine because it's before Christmas, so the diet come after. So right now, just know that in average, in the chocolate recipe, you always have around 40% sugar. So yes, sugar is a filler. Then afterwards, you have cocoa ingredients, but you actually also have dairy ingredients. You also have vanillin, you have lecithin, you have quite some ingredients. It's a simple recipe, but still. You have also what we call milk compound. Compound is really uh, the product where you have more than 5% fat. And please don't think that compound is bad. 
Um, I had this experience, for instance, going into the middle of Philippines, seeing some farmers, and then I thought good to bring them some Swiss chocolate. But then when I distributed it to them, it was completely melted. And actually with the compound and with this fat and their specificity, you can create the same experience as you in Europe eating a chocolate bar in Asia and still it's not melting and you have this experience in the mouth. So don't consider necessarily that vegetable fat are bad. They are technical actually, and they can bring the same experience to anybody in the world. And this is really crucial. The other elements, uh, why commodities and why analysts is because when you look at the chocolate bar and the cost of it, as I said, it's a relatively simple ingredients. You still have 70% of the cost that is lying in the cost of the raw materials. So it's quite crucial for us to understand uh, the cost structure that we have. So my learning here, and uh, the key message is really chocolate is just much more than cocoa. Now I'm the best to kind of sell that because I've been hired by Barry Calabo to be the non-cocoa analyst. So doing everything except cocoa. <laughs> so I'm gonna talk to you about any ingredients, but not cocoa. So I think at the end of the day in the job of analyst, one key element is that we can't, as I said, really guess the future but we have fun in it and how we do it, we look at what happened. From where you come from, you have a higher chance to know where you go. So where does I come from? Actually, I come from this countryside, which is in the middle of France. This is really the terrace of my parents. They are actually farmers. So it's a fantastic view, 150 hectares, one boss, the dream, my, my, my father, He's only a boss. He started with 800 sheep more than 40 years ago. Then he went 100% organic. I let you imagine more than 30 years ago how visionary he could be. But in visionary and in testing, you have bad experience. Actually, he was too early in the market, higher, too high cost. So the first time that uh, basically there was uh, too much subsidies to have more farmers going organic, not even the, not enough demand, price collapsed and his business model collapsed. He was forced then to land his rents, which is very difficult for a farmer when you have to land it. He had to diversify, go back to crops, normal crop, give up on organic when you are convinced it's a hard. Um, so then he had really to step back. He succeeded to get out of it, to take back his land, which is extremely difficult. And then he started cows for meat. And then afterwards he came back to organic. Uh, and now we are really at the level, my father is uh, more than 80 years old and he's still questioning who will take over the farm. So if I'm putting a coin in the middle, is a bit the two side of it, is that a farming is a nice uh, job and it's fantastic. You see it with the countryside, but at the same time, it's a very hard job. And when I take my helicopter, that's where I really come from. And this, is, I really mean it from, uh, in, uh, it's one of my beliefs. Farming is really one of the most humble and necessary job in the world, but it's also one of the least remunerated. And this is purely unfair to my perspective. Now, again, who am I? This is part of my, actually, passport. This is my name. De Crevoisier de Vomécourt. And on top, to complexify it, they have put Épouse La Ville since I'm married. So like you can imagine how I'm happy to now just call it La Ville, which means the town, instead of De Crevoisier de Vomécourt. But what really your mind think when I'm just selling De Crevoisier de Vomécourt? What people think when I, they had it, my subscription for when I had a, a competition or when they were seeing me on a list? What really in your mind is, and this I've got uh, this several times, actually you really have more or less with this type of name, the Im you imagine already the royal family, certain level standard and the castle. Of course, the castle is a must. Actually, reality is slightly different. So this is my parents. My father tried a bit to get closer to the queen. He didn't succeed. My mother never ever would even have tried. Our living standard was slightly different. And the castle, indeed, we had a castle. It was sold already so many years ago. It has been resold just from, I'm, I'm now almost 40 years old. It has been sold at least three or four times. It was even abandoned. And the last time it was sold was on an auction for less than $200,000, just because the taxes to maintain such building is much higher than the cost to purchase it. This is more the reality. 
And ultimately, how I felt with my name and my family is like this. Actually, we are six children and uh, from a family, from a farming family uh, with end of the month, quite difficult to solve, but a lot of fun. And now more than eight grandchild, actually. So what I mean here is what I learned as well is what comes uh, behind the image is really the people and we need to dig. My studies, what to do? Honestly speaking, I had no clue. So then my father sit me on a chair and said, okay, what do you want and what you don't want? And then at that time I say, what I don't, uh, um, I don't know what I want to do. That's clear. I need to work outside. I need to work with animals. That, that's what I want. What I don't want, I don't want to be in an office. This is definitely not for me. Behind a computer and Excel, I would die. You know, I'm an analyst today. Huh? Uh, and I'm practical, absolutely not theoretical. So guessing the future, forget about it. Actually, what I learned here is that I knew nothing about or myself. I think we are also evolving a lot in our, any of our age now getting 40. We never know ourselves, actually. We are learning through our experience. But what actually now I know is that much more than where and how I want to be, actually, I just more uh, want to stick with my values. My first value, you got an idea about it, is the fairness already with the experience of my father. The second one, I'm going to show it to you, and the third one also, are purpose and people. And actually, I think with my company, I'm fitting this value for the moment. So the perfect solution, my father told me, just do agronomy. And I think he was so right. And this, I would really recommend this background. For the point that this is a fantastic one, it's from seed to fork. So from the seed you put in the, land, in the ground till the, as a consumer, you get it in your plate, that anything that concern uh, this flow of natural um, and uh, I would say biological aspects from really vegetables to also animals. Here you see on the right, I have asked to my university where people works after having done this background. You see how many are in food manufacturing, I'm part of them co-op and farming services. It goes also to financing, insurance, logistics, farming, environment, retailers. I don't think you have a lot of training where you can be so flexible at the end of the day to choose in which domain you want to work. And it's also a lot of fun because we were 150 in the promotion. And I nearly have a friend in any of the food companies that exist today. And it's really fun when we compare also our experience. Now, uh, as I reminded to you, we had the bankruptcy and the bankruptcy came at the same moment that I had my three years done and it's five year studies. So there the bank just told me, basically your father is as too many debts, we stop financing you. I was like, what? You have invested in me for three years of study. You don't let me finish the two last. Does it really make sense? This was super hard for me as a student to go over it. I had no choice. My father could not do anything. I had to take my file and go to every bank to beg for money. That was extremely tough. A lot of them refused. One of them even told me, ah, oh, you know, we can't lend to you because once you will have your diploma, you will need to have a, you will want to have a car. And with this, you will never have the money to have the car. I say, what? I need a car. I need a diploma first to be able to pay my car. No. And what I realized is when you're panicking and you have no other solution, you have to ask for help. And actually, my university, I didn't even know it while I was taking loans for my study, had a, a, a lending for free, so kind of a zero interest rate, plus gave me a grant. So thanks to my university, I could finish my studies. And since then, I'm also participating as much as I can in that program because it really saved my life. And my helicopter, again, if you need help, don't be ashamed because actually there is a lot of help around. It's just that we never think about asking for it. And people are also happy to help. The university was happy. One of the teacher also made me work. I was cleaning the lab and this was my pocket money. I was so happy. He was happy. Let's just help each other. When we need something, there is no shame in asking. Then the location. Ah, oh, You see my home, you see Toulouse and you see Beauvais that I had the choice between Beauvais and Toulouse. Toulouse would have been my first choice. Don't think twice, see a little bit. It's a bit like Baywatch. You see also the university, how they present it uh, in the slide. Huh? Looks great, no? Why would I have even hesitate with the other one? Uni La Salle, look at that building, how they sell it, my God. 
and the name. And this is really, if you know the movie, the Shti, definitely I didn't understand the word when I arrived there. And finally, guess who I choose? I choose Bove. Why? Because in the last minute when I came there to present my, my candidature, I had a, a, a preview, a student that when I crossed, I saw a horse in the field and said, what is this? And she said, there is 800 students. Over the 800 students, two can get their house while they are studying in the place. And I said, I want to go there. I tell you, when I told to my parents, I want to go to Beauvais, I didn't explain all these details behind. They didn't even know. And they were really, all my family took me like crazy. And at the end of the day, actually, it's my horse that you see. I could succeed to have these two seats, one of these two seats for two years. This was a fantastic experience for me. So again, without money, you can do a lot, honestly speaking, if you just want. And that hope was really true. a small element that made me make a choice. At the end of the day, I met my husband and since we are together since 20 years. So that was the good bet. So what counts uh, when you negotiate, and this is so true working for a sourcing department, is not always what is the obvious. Always think that there is something else in a negotiation that can have more value. Here it was for me just a seat for, the hope to have a seat for my horse. Then I started to work, as I explained, now I'm getting to the second line, Avalis Institut du Végétal. So here, just let's have fun about the French. I'm French, I'm proud of my, I'm, of my country, but still we are very special. Look at my email address. I was a, at the time starting as a student. Imagine how I had to spell with my little English, my email, A dot D E V O M E T O U R T at, and then now I lost the habit. Ultimately, I gave my private email. I was sending them an email and saying, answer me on this one. <laughs> crazy. Even more crazy in the French Research Institute a made in France tax. This is CV, actually this institute is paid by the CVO. If I want to translate it, contribution volontaire obligatoire, I see some already laughing. Actually, in other words, this means contribution, indeed, voluntary, compulsory. Only the French are able to put the tax to say, we do it voluntarily, but please, everybody has to pay. So uh, actually it's each farmer is paying on a ton of cereal he's producing. What I learned actually in that institute, which is crucial for my career today, is that the farmer's profitability can be higher with lower yields. That was really one of the first researchers that was saying, we are pushing too much yield. And you see the environmental issue we have today. The extra amount of yield was costing more for the farmers than actually the remuneration of it. But when you have an institute paid by the volume produced proportionally, this creates some conflicts of interest. And this is very fairness, again, put me a bit in a trouble in that situation. The other point which I learned, which also is a fantastic learning for me, is that farmers working together can compete with any region in the world. I had example where eight farmers were gathering together and were much bigger than a one farmer in US. The problem is that farmers always look at their neighbor because it's a small, you are really in your job. But actually the competition is not the neighbors, it's often another country, another region. So let's go to chocolate now. You know a bit more where I come from. For me, there is chocolate company and chocolate company. Barry Boats. Here, what you see actually, it's like a dairy, a dairy truck, but it's eaten and it's, it's melted chocolate inside. Looks nice, no? <laughs> actually this is the majority of our volume it's really getting out and then being pumped into the the factory of uh, of big brands where they are inclusively putting the chocolate into their their chocolate competition you don't know barry about that's normal we are a b2b company so we don't have any um uh interest into developing our image because we are a, basically a supplier of chocolate ingredients to people that know very well how to sell and we have fantastic clients for that. Now you can see also that we have uh, some competitors. I'm not going to go into the picture of it. In general, you see some of the brands that uh, we are delivering. So it's it's shifting. Basically, Barry Calabot is sourcing a quarter of the global crop of cocoa. So any four, any products among uh, among four products you're eating, you have a chances that uh, uh, one of the four has come, the chocolate has come through our pipeline. 
we have also, so you see like the coating in Magnum, we are also uh, working with uh, Mondelez on the Oreo, for instance, KitKat also with our new Ruby chocolate, the pink one. Um, now, at the end of the day, we have more than 60 plants, quite a lot of chocolate academy also to train chef around it. In terms of figure, plenty of figures. Um, uh, what I would say is in my 13 years, when I started, the sales volume was uh, 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 reached almost a million. So we have more than doubled. Um, but at the end of the day, this is a bit like any company, no? Where is the difference? Actually, for me, there is a difference and the difference comes just from that sentence. It's the merger of a Belgium and a French chocolate makers driven by a German family listed in the Swiss stock exchange. And what really makes the difference behind is when you have a little bit more in the dig in the share, you know, right now we are asked more and more to look at the labeling of what we eat. And I would really recommend you to dig a little bit who are the shareholder of which company. Here in our shareholder, actually, we have 40% is owned by a foundation, which is the Jacob Foundation. And the second biggest shareholder is the Jacob family. What this means behind is that the Jacob Foundation mission is education. And if you think it through, there is one, I, I didn't find anything else that you can give to a kid or to somebody that can never be taken back. This single element is education. Once you educate somebody, you can do whatever. You can put him in the jail, whatsoever. This education stay. stay. And uh, actually, you see that the majority of our profits directly is re, uh, reoriented into this Jacob Foundation with this duty of educating and that we believe that this is really important. And this is where I come to the purpose. In this company, I get a purpose. What is really interesting is that still we are listed in the stock exchange, which means that it's a perfect mix between the challenge of having a competitive company that continue to grow and that is competitive that attracts investors, but at the same time for a lot of certain projects can take the time to take decision and make them smartly or so forth thinking long term. Uh, so what I learned there is that you can definitely actually balance business and purpose. And most probably, I think we should always have both in consideration in the future. One of those elements is that uh, we have uh, uh, moved towards sustainable, towards our, our program, which is Forever Chocolate, where the, the, the target behind is make choco sustainable chocolate the norm. Why? Because it should not be an exception, honestly speaking, that what we buy is not impacting our planet, that the farmers from who we buy are decently paid, uh, that our forests are protected, right? It should not just be a, a selling purpose, it should be a normality. Now to get to that normality, it takes time and then you need a long investment in time. That's the choice of Barry Calabot. We have to be fair. So when you have to handle a quarter of the global crop, you can't just say, I work with you, 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 and not you, right? You have to find a solution. That's why we have four pillar, prospering farmers, zero child labor, thriving nature, and sustainable chocolate. Saying there is no problem in the supply chain would be a pure lie. So that's why, uh, farm, as I said originally, farmers are very poor and this is not just cocoa farmers. I can tell you coconut farmers are extremely poor as well. We have plenty of issues in that fine. Child labors, actually one element as analysts, we all know that very well. What you can count, you can improve, right? If you can't count, it's more difficult. So here, actually, we raise them, but more important is to treat them and make sure it never happened again. Unfortunately, it's still the case, but we are treating them. Thriving nature, which is more linked to deforestation, think around, uh, as I explained you, the portfolio and the many com co commodities we have. If we would protect one forest, out of chocolate, uh, of cocoa, for cocoa, uh, for instance, farmer, and say to them, okay, fine, don't crop here, we protect that forest. But then a pan player is coming, or a timber player is coming, or any other uh, crop is coming, or uh, even uh, also cattle is coming, then you don't protect that forest. So we need to think about it on an holistic. All the crops are a problem around those forests. So we have to work together on those issues. Sustainable chocolate at the end of the day, 100% sourcing. We were this year having the, uh, we just launched the first 100% sustainable chocolate uh, with the Karma brand, which is a Swiss brand. 
Here, what I learned uh, from this path on the, uh, and I'm working very closely as an analyst with the sustainability team is really that uh, I call it the ivory tower. When you have, you can always choose to really have your supply chain that is absolutely controlled. You know your farmer, you pay them well, you make sure there is no, you can do this ivory tower, but as I explained, what is more important is also to make sure that the basis is lifted, right? And that the problem of ivory tower is that then you are helping people and it's great because you show a pilot, but then you need to scale because the next door crop, the next door farmer still has an issue and we push back the issue. So there uh, we all have to do something. One stuff here, which is more insightful, if you want to be inspired, it's inspired me uh, heavily. If you go on Netflix, Insights Build Brains, that's three episodes and the importance of scaling there is really uh, highlighted and it's an amazing uh, show on Netflix. So let's go back to my job. What am I doing every day? The basis of my job, why your price goes up and down. And this we need absolutely to understand it. It's a question of availability at the end of the day. I always hear people thinking this price is not the right price. This is an unfair price. This is too high. This is too low. Actually, no. What is unfair or where the problem is in the balance is, is when you have actually an unbalance between demand and uh, supply. If demand is much bigger than supply, naturally what happens, the product is scarce, so then the price starts to go up. Why the price goes up? Because once it's high enough, less people can access it, so there is less demand. And at the same time, as the price is higher, more people are, are inclined to produce it to produce more of it. So then you go back to the other balance. Once the price went up, then they went down. Why? Because then supply increase and at the same time, uh, uh, demand decrease. Actually, price is the variable to make the perfect balance between the two. And that's what we are looking for, this perfect equilibrium. Therefore, my job as an analyst is to try to anticipate where is the demand, where is the supply, are we in this or that situation? And once again, it's impossible to control price. I have seen many examples, we can discuss it, about cases where the controlled price, it always fails. Always, it takes time, but it fails. So really, price is the variable to find back the supply and demand and not the reversal. So stop all the politics around fixing price. This doesn't work. The focus of the analyst is finding the trends. Is it up? Is it down? And it's often from macro to micro. So bear with me because I'm going to go really macro to really micro. Macro, the world is ever changing. This is a picture that we always often is used to present chocolate industry. And honestly speaking, a few years ago, I just loved it because I think it's really true. You know, it's my child. He has as much as he wants and he enjoyed the moment. It's like also when they go outside and play with the mud. I really love it. Just enjoy. Right. We all want to have this kind of pleasure. But I think more and more. There is a bit of embarrass around this kind of picture. And also since COVID, especially. I think the problem now is that we are turning for more on individualism. And I think we, have to, we should be proud that today we have access in abundance of everything because this was a fight of our parents and our grandparents. But nowadays we are living in a world where now it's accessible. So now we should maybe pick and choose what we really want. No? And that's a bit what COVID is forcing us. What do I really want in life today? And sharing, I think is becoming crucial. And this I'm going to show you where is it. Actually, one of the big trends is the difference between millennium and generation Z. So I always heard about millennium now for 14 year, 40 years. I'm so happy that now we start to go to another trend, generation Z. And here I'm going to concentrate on this point. Self-centered, what I explained before, we self-aware. How does it translate today? Actually translate very, um, um, I would say, concretely. Look at this. You know the movement of Gilets Jaunes. You know the movement of Me Too. You know the movement of Black Lives Matter, right? But who is behind? On the other side, I talk to you about Microsoft and you tell me Bill Gates. I talk to you about uh, Facebook and then you tell me Mark Zuckerberg, right? Amazon, we also know who is Mr. Amazon. It's finished. It, this trend is over. Now we are into a, a movement where, again, we have access to everything. So we don't want to see successful people. We want to be successful 
a successful crowd, right? We want to all be able to live into the same planet. But this has a danger. And the other danger, I think the most obvious is terrorism. When you look at it, as much as you can't control the Gilets Jaunes, Me Too, and Black, uh, Black Lives Matter, and that's why we love it, we can't control terrorism because there is not one guy behind that we just need to kill and then it's solved. So, and here I'm talking a bit too quickly huh, because I will not kill people, but okay. What I mean there, and uh, this I, I learned it from my grandfather. He always told me this, as good as you want to do, I get, there is always a perfect effect, a perverse effect in what you want to do. So just push the goal because the goal is good. And I think we have more of this movement that we agree are good, but at the same time, minimize the perverse effect. Another inspiring network that I put here, the lead network where my company just joined as well, um, is really all the, the food manufacturing gathering there and also exchanging about inclusion and diversity. I also advise you to go there because it's a fantastic network where you can also have mentors. Now, I'm going to very macro to micro. Micro is my team. How does I work every day actually with them? Right now, I have a team. I'm working with a team which is not, I call it my team. It's not they report to me, right? I work with them. And uh, it's above 28 nationality all over the globe, as you have seen. And these are, are for instance, I took picture of the buyers. So of course, I'm hiding them a little bit. They are not aware they're on the picture. But there, you see, I could in five minutes find back this picture. They were in the field. So sugarcane, you can see coconuts because we buy coconut oil, dairy. It gives you a bit of spirit also how they are. And this is how our, our calls, for instance, and, uh, and, and the team more globally. And I think you can see everybody smiling. The micro is when I want to send a message that actually prices are gonna go down and it's green. Actually, I realized when I communicate with all those buyers that none of them has the same green as I am because we are all different. We all have a different background. They have their personal portfolio, the different uh, situation. And even I found some that were violet. It was like, wow, how can I, I come with a green message and it is violet for you. Can we discuss a bit further? The key learning here is that for me, our difference are really our strengths in the daily work in the team. But, and moving together is becoming a must. There is no choice. But then this requests a lot of patience and humility because honestly speaking, with the language, with the timing, with the origin, with the backgrounds, we, understand this, we don't understand the same method and we will never. The reality of analysis, market always surprises. us. Um, this is actually, I don't know if you know Google Trends, that's a super cool tool. Actually, in Google Trends, you can put, for instance, two words and you compare how often people are searching those two words. 100% is the day that there was the most request in that day. And then you just look at it proportionally. Here, there is two oils. There is one which is palm oil and coconut oil. I guess you could imagine how palm oil is in the trend, right? How much we talk about it, huh? Now look which one is what. Actually, coconut oil has much more hype on the web than, than palm oil, even all the scandal with deforestation and whatsoever. What I learned, and, and just to give you an idea, so huh, it's really a minority that defies a giant market because this is an oil and fat mar market, more than 240 million tons. And actually, yes, in red, it's the coconut oil is 3 million is nothing. But the palm oil is more than 40% of that market. And still on the web, it is more successful. So whatever the market that I had to study, and whatever its size, actually, it has its own fundamental and you can have fun even in very isolated markets. Second element, um, um, an element also which we link back to price, and this is the dairy prices actually in Europe, that when it was controlled by the European uh, Commission in order to make sure that farmers are paid enough. So actually price was controlled as we were discussing. One of the elements is that European Commission was buying the product when it was too low, this was too low and resell it when it was too high. And this was a premium they were giving to the world market. So this is where the world market actually was priced when Europe were, farmers were paid. They were so scared with, with the end of the quota, the end of the export restitution. Actually, as soon as the export restitution stopped, prices exploded for many reasons. 
but one of the reasons is that export restitution stopped and we had no more safety stocks. And actually I was hired just here because actually my boss said, hey, this volatility, we never saw it before, we need a help. So when I arrived, he just told me, see that curve, now I don't want to be surprised ever anymore with this kind of movement. And you see, since then I had a lot of fun actually. But the second conclusion is that the world market get back to the European level and not necessarily that the whole market collapsed, but it went more together and together actually we needed dairy products. There is a lot of story, I can talk for ages behind it, but it's really crucial. And why is it crucial? You just need to look at supply and demand. In the world, 51% of the milk is produced in Europe. So if you just suddenly close a market or, or don't and stop to make people produce there, immediately price goes up, as I said, supply and demand. Other elements that often what we see is that price goes up very quickly. And uh, so the, the movement is always up and down simply because production is very dependent on weather very often and can fluctuate heavily while demand is very stable. You're not tomorrow gonna eat two or three more tablets of chocolate, even though I would dream of it. That's not the case, right? But in the production, your yield can go down by 50% one year to another. So unfortunately, that's where also it's so unfair for farmers. Usually market pays when they have nothing to sell. And on the other side, Farmers are so fragmented that as soon as they are paid, actually they double the superficie and they try to increase the yields that quickly that the market can digest. So be cool, be reasonable. When you earn money, just keep it a little bit and invest slightly more. But this fragmentation makes it so difficult and that's where it's an unfair environment. Last, um, innovation in the, I have seen in the past 13 years has no limits. So this is the tree just showing you that actually in the dairy market, I was uh, one of the testimony where a futures market was born. We were asked uh, uh, in our team also to discuss about how the contract should shape. And when you know that in the, the cocoa industry, there's more than 30 years, it's a liquid market and uh, futures you think is settled, but actually no, still a lot of commodity don't even have tools right now to edge. And it was quite amazing for me to see that at my age in the 2020 century, we are still seeing such developments, which kind is old technology. At the same time as well, who would have said five years ago that you could eat a burger? Sorry, I just have to open to my kids. That you could eat a burger and, and don't recognize that this is actually coming from vegetables. I would never have guessed that this is possible. So what I have seen over the time actually is the fact that our capacity to innovate is without any limits as human. The only problem is we need to face the wall, right? And how often have you heard since COVID, we are re revolutionizing, we can work from home, we never thought we could do that, and how many innovation we have seen. Because we have a wall, unfortunately, we need that. Last, volatility, of course, is my daily job. And this is just to show you all the commodity we have to follow um, in a barrel boat. And I index them at the moment where, uh, where uh, actually uh, COVID or the cases in China started to be known and especially also it spread in Europe. So actually it was a moment where Italy announced that uh, it was spread uh, now uncontrolled in Europe. So end of February, then yes, it's true. In a, couple of, uh, in a couple of weeks, and if not months, if you see here, a couple of days as well, minus 40%. And right now we are more than plus 40% in less than six months. That's the type of anticipation we need to do. And in this, again, actually, I can't guess that, right? I have to be honest. You can't guess this movement, but you can manage the risk. So at the end of the day, the job of an analyst is more to manage the risk than, than guessing it. But still, I, I, I think guessing is fun. That's what makes me still wraps for the next step. Analyst fear, last point, will computer replace us? I don't think so. Computer for me is a crucial help but it doesn't replace it and it will never replace us. And, you know, we, uh, we say today that we went to the moon with the power of an iPhone and we could go to the moon, right, at that moment. And today, what can we do with those phones? So many elements with your computer as well. We are just uh, uh, working with an evolution. I used, when I started to have only Excel file, now I have a full database and, I'm, uh, and the support of IMIT now is a must for me. 
But at the same time, it gives me so much more power. Now I have more tools. I'm starting to look into uh, neural networks and uh, machine learning. This is just fantastically new opportunities. At the same time, it remains a basic job. Analyst is just the top of the iceberg. 80% of it is preparation of data and no computer can do that for us. So here, nothing changed. Let's be cool. The more we know, actually, the more we want to learn and the more we want to know. Same way when we discovered at the time and we can talk about it now, the vaccine, did we believe that we still have to do so many research for new vaccine? So by the way, uh, how I felt when I discovered Tableau, this I need to say it. That was so cool. Thank you. And how I felt when I discovered the Tableau community. Yes, we are in the same sheet. Sorry for telling it, but honestly speaking, every day it's such a challenge. <laughs> So, what it really feels like, no, wait, merci mon cher, va regarder la télé, d'accord? So, what it really feels like working in a chocolate company, I think you would have guessed, it's fun. And uh, I really feel good, honestly speaking. Though, uh, yeah, over the years, there is good years, there is bad years, but honestly speaking, it's a good product, so it's easy. Uh, easy to sell, much more than re my research institute. And, uh, and with what we do, the fact that there is a purpose, um, I, we really tend to try to distribute a product that people love. I would also, I would also really kind of uh, ask you to be mindful in the way that same way when you can attack Nutella, you can attack whoever, oh, there is fat and that. Who don't know that actually at the end of the day, uh, a little bit of it is a lot of pleasure. And uh, if you eat a full tablet of chocolate every day, you might have a problem, right? And, uh, but it can be anything else as well. So life is a question of balance. Just balance it out, but have fun and enjoy this moment because right now we have a lot of challenge around us. So my conclusion is I have, I have fun, but there is really no time to rest. Everything evolves, even this technology. And even and if it's fun, I still need to dig into it. And we have a lot of challenge ahead of us. And my last message is a bit for my kids. When I see how much pressure we give to them, uh, we should stop say all the time. I hate it also in this uh, TV show where they say, oh, you're the next generation. You're the one who are going to save us. No, come on. Whatever age we have, we are in the same planet right now, no? So I think we should stop uh, waiting and putting the weight on the next generation, what they should be doing that we didn't do good. Let's do what we can do as much as possible as early and whatever age we are. Um, so for me, it's, it's really depending on each of us to act every day, wherever we are, whoever we are, and whatever position we have to really open about our mouth and try to participate in what we think is good. And for this, I will close because I need to anticipate Christmas is already behind me. I'm already looking at Easter, where, most, where if we could have a vaccine and see the family, I'm going to enjoy the chocolate as much as possible. So have a happy Christmas, but also soon a happy Easter. Thank you very much. Thank You're you very welcome. Much for this inspiring talk. And I think there were some um, very truthful advices um, and everybody can um, learn from that um, and think about it. Thank you very much. So Here we, go. we still have, we have one question and to everyone who um, is still eager to know more and has questions to Agat, please type them in, in the Q and A. We will now answer this one questions, but um, I guess Agat, if you still have time now during the next presentation and you can have a look at the Q and A and type it in, that would be um, great. So we have one question asking you, with commodity trading, there's always volatility that results from environmental change. Have you seen this um, sustainability initiatives affect that market volatility? Um, I'm not so sure to um, kind of, uh, I think it, it does. It does just for the principle that we know that we are, the more we go, the more we have risk that we have more, dra more drastic weather event. 
and more drastic weather events means you need to protect farmers in this. So there, there is even some, some research going on on which type of crops they should have in which region, which are the regions that are going to disappear, which are the regions that are going to, that are, might be the next one for the crop. So there is a lot of impact, which is around also insurance behind, uh, behind it as well, what type of risk you want to insure. And as a company in itself, it's what type of risk. We have more risk of having droughts and less uh, products, more of those years than before. So this type of frequency is also something that we consider in the analysis. I hope it answered the question. All right, thank you very much. If there are not any other questions right now, you still have the opportunity to just type them in in the Q&A box and um, then Agat will try to answer it later. Um, so thank you again. And um, with that, we come to the second part of the Data Plus Women event. Um, so please, Dinushka and Jennifer, your stage is yours. All right, thanks. I'm going to share my screen. Okay. Let me just get this together here. All right. Hi, everyone. I'm Danushki. Hey, everyone. I'm Jennifer. So Jennifer and I both live in Cincinnati, Ohio, which is only about 4,400 miles away from Zurich. So not too far. Um, <laughs> but we um, both conveniently work at the same company. It's called Unifund, and it's in Blue Ash, Cincinnati. And we also co-founded Her Data this year. Um, and Her Data is a platform with a goal to empower and connect women in data. So if you've had the chance to look, we have a website and a blog. And many of the features that we've uh, published this year are all about talking to various different women uh, in, in the community, the data community, and also featuring different projects that have inspired us. Yeah, and even though it's called her data, we don't exclude anyone. We could include anyone and everyone, uh, but with a little extra glitter and sprinkle on the ladies. Absolutely. Yeah, so to get started with our talk today, um, for today, we're going to be talking about our recent Christmas collaboration. And some of the steps that we are going to talk through are the inspiration for the topic, how it all came about, um, how we went about finding the data and the little, you know, problems and not problems that we had finding it, um, creating the visualization, how we kind of separated our tasks and created the whole viz, and then of course, why you should collaborate as well. Absolutely. So uh, Danushki and I, just a little background, we've worked together about four years and we are, have always been big about talking about food. I think that was one of the first things that we just bonded over. Um, of course, because Danushki is a big foodie and a great cook and I am not. <laughs> uh, and then at the time that we've worked together, she has introduced me to so many foods, most of which I can't pronounce. Um, but recently we were talking about the holidays and the Thanksgiving and Christmas cooking, partially in part because she was trying to help me, I'm sure. Um, but that's kind of what sparked our idea in this new project. Yep. <laughs> um, oops, let me just change over here. Oops, sorry. Um, and then jumping into how we went about finding the data. This data set, of course, was not very hard to find. It was not challenging to find this data, which typically we don't say. It's always a problem to find the data. Um, but it started off with a BuzzFeed article that we found that had over 25 different recipes from different countries all over the world. And that kind of jump-started um, our process. Then we split into two and found more recipes from other countries in the world. We even put out a little blip on Twitter asking people to give out, give us their recipes so that we could include it in our visualization. Um, but yeah, this process of finding the data was super fun. And um, we actually learned a lot about countries and recipes from all over the world. 
Yeah, absolutely. And just kind of piggybacking off of that, speaking from the heart, I think one thing in terms of jumping into this data community, because um, maybe unknown to everybody that I'm talking with right now, I recently went through a transition of a, a background in HR, a master's in HR, and completely switched careers into this data community in Tableau. And I think one of my obstacles to really jump into the community was thinking that there was one way to do this. You know, you find your data, you perfect your data and you visualize it. Well, sometimes it just happens a bit different. You know, sometimes I see a pretty picture. Sometimes I have a topic in mind. And it just comes about in a different order and that's okay. Um, luckily for us, we, we instantly had this idea about cooking and spices and herbs from around the world. And we were able to quickly source the data. So just to kind of put it out there that there is no right or wrong way to go about this. Yep, we all get inspired by so many different things. So without further ado, let's jump into the viz. Okay, so of course, Tableau Public must refresh. Alrighty. So here is our full viz. Um, our viz is called A Taste of Christmas and it is focused on Christmas herbs and spices from all over the world. So a quick little rundown of our viz right here. Yep. So yeah, getting started in this project, we instantly, thankfully we instantly know each other pretty well and we know each other's strengths, which led um, Danushki to be our map whiz. And I kind of focused on the Burby, uh, Burby, <laughs> Burby bump chart at the bottom. Yeah, so I only had to create about 20 different map styles that Jennifer finally agreed to. So no big deal. <laughs> um, uh, no, but I created this um, map. She's kidding. I created this yeah, I'm kidding, I'm kidding. <laughs> Maybe. Uh, I created this uh, map on Mapbox and it was really fun to dig into all the different things that you can do on Mapbox. And I've never created a transparent map before. So that was really exciting to do for this purpose. Um, and then um, these lines on the map, I created them using uh, Wendy Shija's uh, method. If you're not familiar, Wendy uh, recently wrote a blog post explaining how to draw lines on a map and it became very popular and all the, like so many people started using it. So I was like, well, I must use it too. So um, her instructions were very clear. They were easy to follow, um, really easy to understand. And it was easy for me to adapt it to my use case. Um, and something fun actually that was a little challenging, but able, we overcame it. Like every, all of this is on one sheet, which is kind of exciting <laughs> instead of layering so many different sheets under and under. So yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, it was really, for me, really interesting to just understand once we were looking at all of these recipes and diving into the data, it was really interesting to just kind of coming from a non-cook uh, to understand just how these herbs and spices are used. And so we have this uh, bar chart uh, that's representing how often and how frequent these different herbs and spices are used across the various different recipes that we've selected. So instantly I knew, okay, we need a bar chart. Right. But from there, um, I was really drawn to the idea of doing, you know, the Sankey curvy line. Forgive me. I don't know the proper vernacular for this chart, but I, I knew instantly that was going to be my visual. Um, I think it's a really fun way to show relationships between different items. Um, and the method is something I've used before. And thank you. Shout out to Kevin Florlich, who I, I think is listening in. Um, I know he wrote a fantastic blog post. If you haven't read it, um, it's about the curvy bump chart. Not only does he walk you step by step, but he has templates um, and templates in Excel and templates for uh, Tableau, which really helps not only just plug and go, but I think it really helps you dissect and understand what really is happening. So again, it made it pretty bulletproof, I would say. There are a few challenges, but uh, I, that was a really fun project. Yeah, so let's go a little bit. So um, if we, so each dot here obviously represents its own country. And if you click on any country, let's pick um, Guatemala, for example. 
Okay, so um, when you click on the country, it shows you the ingredient that the recipe uses and the green line goes to the herbs that are used and the um, brown line goes to the spices. And then when you come down here, you're able to see exactly what herb and what spices are used and what the recipe finally is. So in Guatemala, the recipe that we found was for tamales and they use oregano and cumin to make tamales. So if you have oregano and cumin in your fridge or in your spice rack, you might be able to make tamales. Absolutely. And one of the other things that we built into this, um, if Danushka you want to show, is beyond just navigating down from the map, we're able to kind of see, you know, garlic and the cinnamon and some of these different herbs and spices. Click on those, we're able to just see the span that they have. So it, I quickly guessing here, maybe about 50% of the recipes that we selected, you're using garlic. So um, that's great for me because I do love garlic. Not so great for me that I, I've never used fresh garlic and wouldn't know what to do with it. But if you have that in your home, you know that one of these recipes you could probably select. Um, and then beyond that, from the bottom, you can select one of the recipes and it will do just the reverse. You can see what the herbs and spices are within the recipe. Um, and then there's also a link to connect to directly to the recipe and see the full step-by-step um, -step guide. Yeah, right here, right here to download all the recipes. Yes, you can also download all of our recipes in our Christmas cookbook. Yeah, we've done half the work for you guys already. <laughs> so um, Jennifer, what would you say your favorite part about this viz is? Okay, being that I'm not somebody that knows how to do a map at this point. I've tried, but I've been a bit unsuccessful. I really love, I kind of think the wow factor for me, this is, I'm, I'm, I know I'm um, partial, but I love the map that you put together, Danushki. I think the fact that you were able to achieve this all on one sheet, um, and then the ability to, you know, have the dots that were laid on the lines really aided the play control that we wanted. We wanted this wow factor where you look at the map and boom, this bolt of lightning. And I think the, the way you put this together really um, was a huge, huge success. Yeah. <laughs> um, I think for me, my favorite part is the interactions within the whole viz where you can click on top of the map and you have an interaction all the way down to the end. I think that was kind of fun. Um, I, of course, love this like crazy uh, craziness um, at the bottom of the chart. I think um, you could not have done a better job with this. It's, it's kind of beautiful. So yeah. <laughs> yeah, and then talking about the challenges, we can't not talk about the challenges. Danuski, what was your biggest setback or challenge? Um, I think our big, my biggest challenge was after we did, after we created the whole visualization, we were so pumped, we were so happy. We were like, okay, well now we have to create the interactions that go from the top of the chart to the bottom of the chart, right? Obviously, because that would be perfect. And then we both look at it and we say, oh my gosh, we have two different data sets. So I have created my map and my own thing with my own data set and Jennifer created this with her own data set. So there was no um, perfect link between the two data sets. So it, we got through it. We might have had to call a friend, but we got through it and um, it worked perfectly, but uh, that was definitely challenging having two data sets. So I would definitely encourage you guys if you're collaborating to make that one data set. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I think that was, you know, when you're working by yourself versus collaborating, one of the biggest lessons. I think for me, also, one of the big challenges I had was, you know, we're trying to work off of one file and phone a friend. Yeah, sorry, Kevin. I saw that. Love it. Thank you, Kevin. Um, I think working off of one Tableau file, working off of one supposed Excel file was a bit challenging because, you know, I would get a few minutes to be able to burst in and work on something, but, oh, I can't save. I don't know if she was in it or not. So certainly uh, there are pluses and minuses that kind of takes us into our next part. I think we did that part pretty well, though, because I knew, okay, at Five o'clock, Jennifer's kids get home. So now I can get on the biz and work on it. But at seven o'clock, I need to get off because her kids go to bed and now she's working on it. So I think because we were able to communicate between us well, it so happened to kind of 
work well together. I totally had to get you on my kid's schedule. That's all it was. <laughs> <laughs> so um, now that you've heard a little bit about our favorites, um, about others, we'd like to talk a little bit about why we think you should collaborate. So one of the first things that we noticed or we took away was learning to work together. Typically you're working by yourself if it's a personal project or you're working on a dashboard for work, you're by yourself. You make the rules, it's your way or the highway, you make the colors, it's all your decisions. But now there's someone else's opinion coming in, you know, they may disagree with you and some little bit of yelling back and forth. <laughs> Okay, I have to stop you. I feel like we're joking. Just so everybody knows. <laughs> totally joking. <laughs> uh, no, but absolutely. I think I, I love working with Danishki, and I think we have the benefit of um, it was such an easy collaboration because we knew we could push each other's buttons a little bit. We knew we could assert our opinions. And I think it really worked well that our styles just mesh. Um, she would try something that I wouldn't try. And I think, honestly, I learned so, so much on this because um, I think to be inspired, to be Jennifer, I think you're breaking up a little bit. Okay, I'm gonna move on to the next one. When she comes back, she will finish her sentence. <laughs> okay, okay, well then whatever I said, that's <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Okay, so the next takeaway was shared knowledge. It was really interesting because I have never created a bump chart. So it was interesting to see Jennifer work through that bump chart using Kevin's um, template and kind of putting her own twist to it. Um, just watching her was really inspiring for me because I had never done that before. And I think when she was watching me work on Mapbox, she was like, oh, what did you just do? Show me that again. So it was really nice sharing our knowledge and um, that's obviously a huge benefit. And beyond the Tableau and Excel or Mapbox knowledge, I think it was equally fun that Danushki took me on a tour of her spice rack. Um, I, I really, I'm not trying to be self-deprecating here, but I had no idea what some of these spices were or what they even look like. Um, I have a salt and pepper shaker and maybe some garlic and cinnamon, I really do. But uh, it was really fun because um, it just kind of opened my world to kind of all these other herbs and spices. I might just try to make a sauce and throw them all in there. I don't know. Yes, I did take her to my spice rack and I was like, okay, this is cinnamon. This is cloves. And she was like, wait, what is a clove? What is the star <laughs> one called? I don't even know, but a lot was learned beyond just Tableau. Yes. Um, the next reason we think you should collaborate is because you have twice as many ideas. Typically, it's just you in your own little bubble. You have seen a picture that inspired you and you're just going. Now you have someone else's ideas. You have twice as many creative juices flowing. And I think that really um, helped this process a lot. Absolutely. And I think I, I so, I, I loved all of the ideas. I think one of the things that was kind of a challenge in that light was, okay. Oh, just on We have a deadline. If we could go, we probably uh, would. You're good, better? sorry. Yes. Okay, sorry, I'm so sorry. Um, I think that the challenge of that was, um, we had so many ideas that we could go forever. I think having that deadline kind of, you know, we couldn't put all the sprinkles or all this, the glitter that we maybe would have, but um, it was certainly a lot of fun. Yeah. And then, of course, our outcome was so much faster. We had to do only half the work almost. Typically, if you know me and I have an idea and I start a personal visualization, I never finish it. So it was really nice to have someone else join the bandwagon and um, us finish it together and so much faster. We might have had to recreate the entire biz yesterday, but let's not talk about that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Um, yes, actually, I, I love that we're emphasizing faster outcome because there's that accountability. Um, I'm, I'm the same. I, I think a lot of people, you get inspired, you jump into a project, you get moving, and then you don't, eh, no, I'm bored. And so I, I tend to do that, and it's only maybe 1% that I actually put out on Tableau Public. So having that accountability and pushing each other, and yes, the rebuild, rebuilding of it the day before. Um, but listen, you you learn so much by your mistakes. 
Um, had we not blown this up yesterday and had a, a jam session in five hours to rebuild what we did in two weeks, I know this inside and out. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, and of course, it was a super, super fun experience. Um, at the end of the day, we really loved what we did. We loved talking till 10 o'clock in the night, trying to figure out a calculation. And then maybe we didn't even figure it out at the end of the day, but it was still really fun and enjoyable. Absolutely. And at this point, my boys know Danushki as the person in my computer, and they ask for her at bedtime now. So it's been really fun. So yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so thank you so much for listening. If you have any questions, we're happy to take them. Do we have any thank questions? Thank you, guys. Thank you so much. Um, again, I hope um, maybe, Annabelle, we should start a collaboration. <laughs> yes. <laughs> we should, we should. All friends um, will think about it too now. Um, but you definitely um, gave us the taste of it. And it sounded like you had much fun. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. I, I, we're ready for project number two. We're probably just going to take a little break for a while, but we're ready for project number two. You know, we are. We have always open spots um, for the next Data Plus Women sessions for speakers. <laughs> When's that? <laughs> <laughs> honestly, if Jennifer is not nice with you, oh, please, yeah, we're so joking. <laughs> I swear to you, I'm a nice person. I think my internet cut out when I was trying to plead my case, but I swear, <laughs> we're joking. Uh -oh. We have a question uh, from Kevin, but I, I'm not sure that you can answer live to this uh, very uh, tricky question. <laughs> oh, that's really funny. In the last it's photo, fine. are you saying... <laughs> Did my internet <laughs> time out? Is that what you're saying? No, I was know. asking what we were drinking in that last question. Oh, I, I, I was not looking at our slide. Yeah, we, we may have had some mimosas. We had a lot of fun. So for our for data launch, um, we may have had a fun um, afternoon one Saturday and, and went down to the park and took a bunch of pictures um, mm -hmm. because both of us were needing out of our uh, dwelling at home. And yeah, we had some mimosas. <laughs> Do we have any other questions? That was an easy one. I like it. <laughs> so I think we have another question. Yeah, we do. Vince ask you, Jennifer and Dinuski, uh, just embod joy so completely. Uh, please do a simple question so I can pronounce it with my <laughs> French. How have you both keep the energy, the positive energy this year? You know, that's on, I will speak to the heart from that one because that's something Danushki and I were just talking about. It really has been a challenging year. I think we both are very positive laid back people. But I think the isolation, we've been both working remote since March, it is challenging, but I think I'm grateful to our company. I'm grateful to have a wonderful team. We get on Zoom calls probably four times a day. And uh, I, 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 I would love to see the numbers on how many hours we've spent on Zoom calls because I just think being able to talk to each other has really helped us. But. Um, 2021 is going to be a really good year, so let's not worry. <laughs> yeah, before the pandemic, when we were in the office together, Jennifer and I would somehow, like, somehow she would creep into our office area and be like, what's for lunch or something like that. So we're always kind of together. So it was hard not to be able to do that. So it was, um, it's definitely, it was being positive was definitely a challenge, but I think we still, I don't know, had a lot to drink and had a lot of fun. <laughs> yeah, and I think that's the funny thing. Um, so in U Unifund, I worked in HR and Kevin and Danushki were in our BI team and analysts. And I just kind of find ways and time and excuses to constantly be down there talking to them. And so I think it's kind of one of those things you speak things to fruition, but you also have to visualize it. So I kind of wanted to make myself seem like, look at me, could I be on your team? So um, let it so be so. 
We have another question, I think, from Lisa. She's asking, um, on, I'm the only Tableau creator in my workplace. Any ideas for collaborating with others when I work mainly with confidential data? So I think um, if, if you are trying to get out of that um, bubble of working with confidential data, then definitely there are so many people in the Tableau community that I'm sure would love to collaborate with you on any topic. Um, but just definitely put yourself out there and talk to people, send them a creepy DM, it's fine. <laughs> um, but just, um, yeah, networking and talking with people in the Tableau community I'm sh has never been a problem and I'm sure you'll be fine. I mean, heck, here we are, collaborate right. with us. <laughs> Absolutely, Lisa. I will say I don't know how active you are in the Tableau community, but I feel still like a newbie to the Tableau community. And um, from the outside perspective, it felt like everybody knew everybody and everybody's a Zen master and I don't belong. Um, but I think that just finding a topic that you love and, and get to know somebody, you know, spend time chatting people up, um, connect with people on, in the community. I promise you, it'll be far less intimidating the more you just throw yourself into it. You have to immerse yourself totally. I think also if I can comment on this one, we just need to detach from the data, right? What you look is for a certain visual, for a certain solution. And uh, you can do that with whatever data. So somehow if it's really confidential, it's not very complex to change the title and um, do put something that is meaningless, uh, change a bit the figure, because at the end of the day, when you have issues, it's more, how can I visualize this principle difference? So I think uh, on my side, I have some time to exchange or so on this and it's confidential information and I just play with this, right? I'm just rebuilding another set very quickly and just saying, here is the principle of the info. How can you help me? And uh, you can still go through without exchanging confidential information to my perspective. Absolutely. And I have worked with HR data as well, Lisa, um, a lot before coming into um, the role that I'm in now. And I think the one project I posted to Tableau Public was a Strength Finder, our, our organization, everybody completed the Strength Finder um, evaluation. So I got permission from um, Jeff Schaefer, who is our COO, to change the names and to completely change the data set. I just made up some names, so it's really funny. Uh, but that way I can showcase what I did with using non-confidential information, if that helps too. Uh, we had one more question. Um, how much experience do you have with Tableau, Jennifer and Danushki? I have been working on Tableau for about four years now, but most of it, like if you go to my Tableau public page, you'll see not a lot of visas because most of my visas, I, uh, most of the work that I do on Tableau Public is at work um, and business dashboards. So it's not beautiful and exciting, but um, yeah. And then Jennifer. Yeah, I, I'm trying to think, what was it? Two, three years now. I, I feel like I, I have two, two timelines in Tableau because I think there was a period of time where I was just kind of playing with it. We were like dating me and Tableau because I really, I come from a, a very heavy Excel background. I know Excel inside and out. I feel really good about Excel. And then Danushki walks in the door and she shows me Tableau and blows my mind um, because I never really understood that there's this visual, um, there's this, this, this story that you can tell. It's not just about a numbers on a spreadsheet. Um, but anyways, uh, cutting to it, I've been using it probably for three years but I think taking myself serious and actually trying to put my head down and learn it, it's been more of a, a year. Yeah. That was a long-winded answer, sorry. That's me. <laughs> all right, thank you so much um, for answering all the Q&A. Um, if there's still, still some questions or um, yeah, if there's anything which is still open, um, you can stay um, for a few minutes afterwards um, for the networking event and then just text us um, if you want to get in touch with the speakers. Um, so that being said, we are already at the end of our sessions. Um, so if there's anything um, you want to share with us, if you're interested in speaking um, for the next event and we already have plans for the next year, so please feel free to get in touch with us. And um, you can visit our hub page um, as mentioned on the slides here or just follow us on Twitter or just text us on LinkedIn, whatever channel you prefer. Um, and 
with that, um, we want to say thank you that you participated in this event. Thank you to the amazing speakers. I definitely feel inspired and um, I'm ready to start a new collaboration with someone. So thank you for that. Um, and of course, because we are in December, have a very um, nice Christmas break. Merry Christmas and almost, I can say, um, a happy new year. Thank you to all of, um, of you for all your effort and, and passion and sharing this with us. Thanks for having us. That's fun. Thank you for <laughs> and if people want to stay, we will promote them as um, panelists. So just raise you and if you would like to stay and I will allow you to talk over rise. <laughs>
a little bit also, yeah, you know, if it's uh, not the standard colors and stuff, you don't go as quick. Now I played a lot with it. Uh, uh, actually, originally at the beginning, uh, my boss was making presentation really high with my analysis. And I had fun to put a little cow that was eating grass in the middle of it. Each time I was talking about an index, which is cow, which is actually a grass index. So it was really for making them represent it. And actually at one moment, one of the very uh, high people came to me. I was like, well, what's going on? They said, you're the girl with the, the, the cow that eats grass, right? <laughs> and, uh, and he told me, ah, we have so much fun because on his slide of your boss, we're just waiting this one when it's coming. And, uh, and it was funny because actually two hours before my boss came and said, now I got this cow with the grass. You got it. <laughs> Finished. <laughs> I don't want it anymore. And actually, I think for me, I told him that it works because actually the only game was here to re-attract at to rebring attraction to that level of information when you have 150 slides in a whole day, you need a bit of distraction. So that's a bit for me how I play a little bit with the design. I think it needs to be nice. Otherwise it's uh, also you, you lose it, but at the same time, you need to not distract too much because at the end of the day, they didn't concentrate it uh, on really that index, they concentrated on that cow and bring them back to the conversation. So for me, it's really something where we have to play. And unfortunately, business don't let us time often to have the nice design we would like to have, which is unfortunate. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, a question uh, for I got. Um, I had done a project about a year ago in um, in the realm of commodities uh, trading and specifically in derivatives trading. And one of the things that we struggled with was how to approach sort of storytelling with some of this data because so much of it was purely kind of, you know, market analytics and numbers driven. And we found it kind of hard to tell a story in that. Um, is that something that you've, that you've got any Kind of advice on like how do you how do you tell a passion and story in something that can seem dry for a lot of people yeah i think actually it's uh, uh for me it's more around my experience and the talks that i have around because what you have to think is that behind any of those curves there is actually a lot of stories, right? Um, in general, any price movement, as I said, behind is supply and demand. So why did it went up at that moment? And then you have a lot of stories. Um, the big question everybody asks himself also is now are the price uh, controlled, influenced by funds and speculative money, for instance? And there you can really show how it goes up, how it goes down. So I would say uh, you have to dig yourself behind this figure first um, but actually, it's quite amazing that then also, uh, for instance, there were the moments where you have the euro, USD, uh, the, 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 the euro with the British pound uh, really moved heavily one day and really strongly. And actually, <laughs> it collapsed, if I recall correctly. And we found out in the market that actually it was most probably a Chinese trader that kind of didn't sleep on his computer because normally there is some security. But you, if you really go into the detail of it on the, on the second case, that you really see a, a tremendous order was given and this created a, a, a full movement in the market. And ultimately, it attracted attention between the value of the of the the pounds and the euro and then you started to have i think the french president that commented the next day about the brexit and then you started to have so many people starting to build a story around this single issue in the trade that then we if you have all the investors and all the traders starting to look at that they started to really have a discrepancy in the price and continuing to have that moment so you could really see the jump and then correction because it was not normal and then actually going there because the story was there. So you see in itself, just one element, it's a super funny story because for me also to read in the press and then see people commenting when you really know what was behind is quite impressive. So I would say it's a fantastic world actually. It's a fascinating world because it's so much linked behind also uh, a lot of those traits sometimes are just uh, mathematics. So in a way you look at the curve and you do curve analysis and a curve analysis that actually don't work because we know what is going on in the curve. It works because you have enough people that look at the same analysis at the same moment. And then as you want to counteract this analysis, actually you start to bet on the other side. So. I, I think for me, I actually naturally, I'm really passionate by it. 
mostly because of the story that are behind actually and uh, and often it's never where you think it's just people that want to buy or sell uh, same way when i saw the birth of the futures market for the dairy what happened is that suddenly you, the buyers realized just by doing a contract in this exchange that actually they just exchanged a volume with a cheesemaker while we are purchasing dairy powder. But the cheesemaker needed an edge. And at the same time, we needed on, the, on that side, or remember, to sell or to buy. And suddenly we could, we could work together and do a deal while we are completely in other kind of business. Cheese is not the same as butter. So, yeah, uh, I think if you miss inspiration on this, just come back to me, tell me which one, and I will find you the story. Really, it, 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 behind its people, behind any of those is people. And if it's electronic trading, it's people again. If it's uh, open interest versus daily volume, it's again people taking decision. That's why you have so many stories behind. And I could continue for hours, honestly speaking. <laughs> <laughs> You have the perfect job for you. I love it. Thank you so much. You're welcome. But why did you look to, to tell the story behind? What was your target, actually? Uh, you know, I in that project, we had a team of, of traders who were very, very familiar with all the nuances of commodities and derivatives trading. And we were trying to offer insights of that analysis to a broader community of people. Um, including people who weren't as familiar with that end of, of economics. And we were trying to identify um, specific uh, storylines and, and ways that we could tell that story emotionally to get people invested in what we were doing with the data. And okay. we ended up being, being successful at that, but it was definitely a challenge to overcome for people who might not be familiar with them. Okay, I think I, there, there are two elements because now I get a bit more your point. The first one is that uh, I think it's just nice to say to people that actually traders are, pers to my perspective, a bit arrogant and liars in the way that <laughs> they are talking with, with words that nobody understands. The spread, the vanilla, the, the, the auction call, option, put a call. Uh, I can tell you so many words. At the end of the day, what a trader do, he buy at a certain level, he sell at a certain level, and he hope that when he has bought, it's lower than the level he has sold and vice versa. The trader job is just this. And I think that's always how I bring back people's attention to it. Because I tell them, actually, you will be surprised. And this, I have seen it also personally very often. When somebody comes with a nice strategy and tell you I buy a call, da, 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 and at the end of the day, you just look at him and say, okay, but what was your goal? When did you buy? When did you sell? What was your target? And then you will kind of find some people a bit dismantled because very often, honestly speaking, it's a huge strategy behind it's very simple. So that's the first element that I think I bring back also people, don't be scared. Don't really be scared because actually behind it's super simple. The second element also is to extrapolate that actually you always think it's a world of speculator. And actually the worst speculator on earth is the farmer. Because who is putting in the ground, investing in a tractor, investing in the land, putting a seed in the ground, not knowing how much he's going to sell it, and waiting for nine months that then it's produced, and then he realizes at which price it is. You know, in the business, we all have factories, we all have, we try to sell ahead and, and, and according to the charge that we have. Only the farmers is speculating that much. And since that there is futures market, he's able at the moment when he decides to put the seeds in the ground to already sell it and then control his cost. And I think it, this also, it helped a lot just to say, actually you, everybody, you are more speculator than those people. They are just securing themselves. So this kind of uh, little element bring you back to more reality. But I think the biggest one on the trading is really uh, to, to actually force people to break the wall around what is behind because it, it's, any strategy I have seen, huh? the most complex with options, trades, multiplicator, at the end of the day, you buy and you sell and you hope to make a margin in between. Finished. Oh, 
copy that. <laughs> Thank you. Do we have anyone um, else from the participants or attendees who want to speak up? No? Okay, so I think that we can close the event if no one wants to speak up. So, thank you very much, Aga, Dinuski, and Jennifer. It was like fantastic event. I think that we closed the year like very beautifully. And um, yeah, uh, we will uh, send the, out the recording. And um, we hope that we will see each other soon to eat chocolate with Agat. <laughs> <To speak about. laughs> In a balanced way, yeah? <laughs> <laughs> don't worry, I can eat one or two tablets per day, it's not a problem. And with Dinuski and Jennifer, about Tableau soon, maybe on the Tableau conference, who knows? <laughs> yeah. thank, thank you very much, thank, uh, everyone, for joining, and see you next time. And don't forget, speak to this event uh, to all your friends so we can <laughs> increase our audience and uh, yeah, bring us new speakers. Thank, thank you. you. Bye. 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 Bye.